If the last decade belonged to renewables, then the next decade will be owned by energy storage. I congratulate you for attending today's webinar to learn about battery-based energy storage systems and the possibilities they entail. I'm Anthony Kapkin, editor of Electrical Business Magazine and today's moderator. Welcome to our primer on battery-based energy storage systems. Let me tell you a little bit about our speaker today. Larry Cantlow is the president of the Electrical Inspectors Association of Alberta. He's been an independent electrical trainer for about the past five years, dealing with topics such as the CE code, energy storage, red seal prep, troubleshooting, electrical theory, solar PV, I could go on. Prior to that, he served as an electrical instructor at the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology for about 12 years, and his various certifications include professional electrical contractor, Red Seal Interprovincial Journeyman Electrician, Business Management, PV Installer, Construction Technology, and Electrical Safety Codes Officer, Groups A and B. I think it's fair to say that Larry knows a thing or two. And with that, I will hand it over to Larry. Take it away, Larry. Thank you very much, uh, Andy, uh, Anthony, and uh, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, if you happen to be towards the western part of the country here. So today I'm going to talk about battery-based energy storage systems. Um, I'll just start to move through the slides here. Um, that, that slide is a little bit more about myself. Uh, I think Anthony has covered most of that, so I'm going to get right into our material. So the energy storage market is expected to install 5.1 billion, that's billion with a B, of equipment in 2020, and that's according to Bloomberg uh, New Energy Finance uh, based in the U.S. Now, I think you can probably realize $5.1 billion is a lot of money. So what is energy storage? Well, it's the capture of energy produced at one time and basically saving it or storing it for use at another time. Uh, sometimes it involves converting energy from one form to another, uh, and sometimes not. So bulk energy storage currently is dominated by pumped hydro, which accounts for most of the global energy storage, uh, but some storage technologies provide short-term energy storage, while others can endure for a much longer period of time. Now, just a little bit more on pumped hydro. So with pumped hydro, basically what happens is with a pumped hydro system, you have basically two dams, a lower one and a higher one. Um, so when the water drains out of the higher dam, it spins a turbine that produces power. Um, when there's excess energy, the water is pumped from the lower reservoir to the higher reservoir. And when there is a shortage of energy available on the grid, uh, the water is released to spin those turbines to produce the, the shortfall. Now, the energy storage market is driven by a number of factors. Uh, one of the big ones is tiered energy costs. Uh, in much of Canada, we don't see that, but in a place like Hawaii, that's an excessive uh, amount of money between the low cost of energy in the, in the cheaper parts of the day and the higher cost and the more expensive parts of the day. We'll see a little bit more of that later on. Grid stabilization is another one. Uh, peak load management, also known as peak shaving. Uh, load shifting, uh, power in reserve, frequency and voltage regulation. Uh, a big one right now is renewable energy source integration. So oftentimes when renewables are producing power, uh, they're not at the time when there's the maximum demand on the grid. So for example, if, if a wind turbine is spinning in the middle of the night uh, when peak demand is very low, that tends to give us an excess of energy. And that's, of course, where energy storage comes in. Backup power supply during outages, and of course, also integration into microgrids. So there's a number of factors driving the energy storage market. Now, here's an example of the tiered energy costs in Hawaii that I spoke about earlier. So in the midday, 10 cents per kilowatt hour, uh, in the evening, 47 cents per kilowatt hour. So almost five times the cost when, when, the, when the grid is at its highest demand. So in, that's, that's a case alone that, that, that gives us an argument for having energy storage. If you can buy the energy cheaper, store it, and then use it yourself or sell it back to the grid when demand is higher. Now, another example of tiered energy costs 
Gas. This one is from California, Pacific Gas and Electric, and the numbers you can see there uh, ranging from uh, in, in tier one there, May to October, from 15 cents to 34.2 cents per kilowatt hour. So those those are huge differences. In this case, more than double. So once again, that provides a good financial case for having energy storage. Now, who are some potential storage users? Facilities in locations with storage incentives. Uh, California is, is one of the leaders in this, but many, many states in the U.S. Uh, are also coming out with incentives. Uh, customers with high peak demand charges, customers with high energy spread between peak and off peak or tiered rates, which we just looked at, and also customers with large variable loads. So there are numerous technologies for storing energy. Some are what we might call mechanical, some are electrical. So pumped hydro, of course, is the most common grid level one. But of course, you can't have pumped hydro every place. We simply don't have the real estate to have two large dams or two large reservoirs in the middle of a large city, as an example. Uh, Battery-based energy storage, which is what I'm talking about today, is one that's rapidly emerging. Uh, flywheel is one that's, uh, that's starting to uh, develop. Compressed air, supercapacitors, thermal energy storage, flow batteries, as well as hydrogen fuel cells. So all of those are in various stages of development, but the one that's really emerging right now is the battery-based energy storage. So this is a, a comparison between some of the different technologies or some of the major ones. So pumped hydro there, we can see it's 100 to 5,000 megawatts, has an efficiency between 70 and 87%, and has a fairly long duration of six to 20 hours. Compressed air, you can see the numbers there, lithium ion batteries, one to 100 megawatts, so obviously a lot smaller. But one of the nice things about the lithium ion batteries uh, installations is they are what we refer to as being stackable. So in other words, it's fairly easy to make the installation bigger. As we can see on that one, the efficiency is very good between 80 and 90 percent, and the duration between about 15 minutes and four hours. So not in a large, not an excessive duration. But once again, being stackable, that can be increased uh, with, with a larger installation. So some of the other characteristics. So construction time is a big one. Operational costs, uh, the cycle life of the battery, so the number of charge dis discharge cycles a battery can perform before nominal capacity falls below 80%. When they do fall below 80%, that's usually deemed to be the end of life of the particular battery for an energy storage application. Some other characteristics, the depth of discharge that the battery can reach while still retaining its rated cycle life, the level of technology maturity, and of course, spatial requirements. As I mentioned, when it comes to pumped hydro, you need a fair bit of real estate. With a battery-based energy storage system, even a large one at the utility level, oftentimes that can be installed adjacent to a power plant or a substation, and they don't need any extra real estate to accommodate the battery installation. So with battery-based energy storage, there's basically two schemes. What I'm gonna call utility, which is in the front of the meter, so that would be typically a very large installation, typically owned by the utility company, and another one at the consumer level, sometimes referred to as behind the meter, and these tend to be a fair bit smaller installations. Now for battery-based storage, there's some facts that I wanna share with you. So in the US alone, 221 megawatts of utility scale battery storage was added in 2016. I don't have those figures for 2017 as yet, Globally, more than 1,300 megawatts of battery storage was deployed in 2016, and the global capacity is expected to grow from 4,000 megawatts today, and that was as of September of 2017, to 50, 52,000 megawatts by 2025. So as you can see, that's a 13-fold increase, which is pretty significant. The global annual growth rate is expected to rise to 4,700 megawatts by 2020, and 8,800 megawatts by 2025. That's uh, information as provided by Power Engineering Magazine in September of 2017. And the price for lithium ion batteries is expected to drop to less than $200 per kilowatt hour by 2019, which is a 
50% drop since 2012. So that is one of the driving forces behind the popularity of battery-based energy storage are those significant decreases in lithium ion batteries. And of course, that coincides with the popularity of electric vehicles and the evolution of the electric vehicle. So we need more and more of these batteries and more and more manufacturers are getting into the industry. So of course, that is driving the price down. So at the utility level, um, some of the reasons we have battery-based energy storage, so peak load management, uh, load shifting, uh, power in reserve if we need it, frequency and voltage re regulation, renewable energy source integration, and of course, backup power supply during outages. So when we talk about a behind the meter system, that's a system uniquely designed and built for a single building, typically, it includes the ability to reduce the carbon footprint of the building by generating electricity locally from renewable sources, to reduce the amount of electricity purchased by the building, and to take the structure off the grid for some of all of the working day, and to provide power conditioning for uninterruptible power supply systems. As well, to eliminate blackouts to the building, providing uninterruptible power during grid failures, to eliminate the damaging effects of brownouts on the building and to buy electricity at the lowest possible purchase rates. Behind the meter system allows you to access electricity from renewable energy sources, typically both wind and solar, and we're seeing a lot now of those combined uh, installations where we see uh, storage and solar as well as some uh, wind and solar as well. Uh, so that gives us the ability to have power as a backup and the energy storage within the battery storage of the behind the meter system. So low technolo technologically it can do so, a, a behind the meter system normally does not sell power back to the grid, it simply stores it and uses it for the, the host building, whatever type of building or facility that might be. Now when we talk about residential uh, systems, uh, one of the ones of course that's getting all the publicity is the uh, Tesla power wall. Um, so I have some numbers there. Uh, those numbers are numbers that I came across in about uh, partway through 2017 and those are in Canadian dollars. So that's a 14 kilowatt hour power wall. So that's $7,800. Uh, the additional hardware and so on about $950. So basically that gives us a total about uh, close to $9,000. Uh, now, from the Tesla website, they did require a $650 deposit, and the typical installation cost ranges from $1,050 to $2,700. Well, once again, that depends on the complexity of the installation and so on. Now, this does not include the solar installation, if you indeed have that, or any electrical upgrades if needed, such as increasing your the size of your electrical panel in the building. It also doesn't include any taxes, permit fees, and so on. Now, of course, the installation costs will vary based on your electrical panel and so on, where you'd like it installed, how far it is from your electrical service and so on and so forth. And of course, the installation will be scheduled after you place your order. Now, there is a photo of a residential battery storage cubicle. Now, Tesla, of course, isn't the only player in this game. Schneider also has a system available. Um, once again, there's some information there about the Schneider. So it's about 30 inches, um, about the size of a flat screen TV, weighing about 55 pounds. And Schneider has the EcoBlade. It's designed to hang on a garage wall, much like its Tesla counterpart. So unlike the power wall, which needs a separate inverter, the EcoBlade is fully integrated. So it has the inverter and everything in the one uh, kit, the lithium ion batteries, charge controller, and so on. They are all included. Now there is a photo of a large battery-based energy storage uh, cubicle, I suppose you could call it. Once again, as you can see, it's a number of different cubicles uh, stacked together in line. And of course, the nice thing about these installations is they, is they are uh, very easy to add more to. So uh, you can basically add more and more uh, as long as you have the real estate space for those. There is a photo of the inside of, of one of those uh, battery-based installations. Oftentimes what's used for these battery-based installations for the larger ones is they simply use a C-CAN. 
or a rail car type can, and then they fit them out with a different racking, put some lights in there, put some uh, fire suppression in there, sprinklers, fire alarm system, and so on and so forth. Once again, there is a different one. Now, the Solar Plus Storage uh, bi-directional DC to DC converter, it's designed specifically for installation with existing or new utility scale solar installations. Uh, this is manufactured by DynaPower. It is what's referred to as bi-directional. So it's 250 kilowatts DC to DC coupled. And it's, not, it's a cost effective approach to coupling energy storage with solar. So as we're seeing more and more, solar and storage is, is kind of a marriage made in heaven, if you will. And we're seeing a lot now of this uh, being installed. And there is a picture there off the DynaPower uh, solar plus storage unit there. Now, as far as some, some information, new information, lithium ion batteries account for 83% of newly announced energy storage system capacity. Uh, uh, I got that from Navigant Research in November of 2016. So as we can see there, um, energy storage in the form of the lithium ion batteries is taking over some of the market from the pumped hydro. So experts agree energy storage, whether it's applied at the utility scale in California or applied by individual businesses and homeowners for backup power and peak shaving in stakes like Vermont, as an example, it has emerged as a key component in the nation. And of course, and that's in the US, that's their clean energy transformation. So much like we have with solar and other renewables, we tend to lag a little bit behind the US here in Canada, but we are seeing some of it being deployed and we'll see a little bit more about some of those projects a little bit later on in the presentation. There is a photo of Tesla's 100 megawatt installation in Australia. That's the one where Tesla guaranteed they could have the system up and running by a certain date. And if it wasn't done by a certain date, the installation was free. But of course, Tesla put all the manpower into it that was needed and they did get it installed and connected in time. And of course, as a result of that, they did get paid for the project. So global energy storage is to hit 120 gigawatts by 2030. Energy storage capacity around the world is about to experience a sharp increase according to analysis from Bloomberg New Energy Finance reaching 125 gigawatts and 325 gigawatt hours by 2030. Once again, you get different projections from different organizations, but I think the common thread among all of those is, is we can see energy storage, battery-based energy storage is going through tremendous growth. So between 2016 and 2030, the firm expects global investment in excess of $100 billion spread equally across several regions of the world. The rapid growth is expected to be similar to solar's rise from 2000 to 2015. And of course, in many parts of Canada, we've seen tremendous growth in solar. However, with all of that, eight countries will lead the charge and install 70% of the anticipated capacity. And I have the countries listed there, US, China, Japan, India, Germany, the United Kingdom, Australia, and South Korea. Once again, you'll note that Canada is not included in that. Uh, we tend to be a little conservative when it comes to this type of technology but I think we can agree that our day will come. So PG&E Pacific Gas and Electric located in, in the US has brought online Tesla's two megawatt hour energy storage facility in Browns Valley, north of Sacramento, which of course is in California. The facility has 22 Tesla power packs with a total capacity of 0.5 megawatts and two megawatt hours and is scalable. Once again, that means it can be added to very easily to meet future demand. And they will use those batteries to improve the management of peak demand and to reduce the need to call on peaker power plants. So if you're not familiar with that term, oftentimes what they have in the US, uh, when the grid kind of gets maxed out and, and it's a little short of energy, they, add, they fire up, these are what are called peaker power plants, they're gas fired, and they supplement the production of the existing power sources. Uh, and then of course they will cut back out once that peak demand has passed. So that's one of the things that we're seeing these battery based installations replace is those peaker plants. Last month Tesla brought 
brought an 80 megawatt hour storage facility online for SoCal Edison and Greensmith Energy brought online a 20 megawatt, 80 megawatt hour Alta Gas Pomona Energy facility for Southern Cal Edison. Using Powell and Energy's Stack 140, so once again, that's stackable energy storage system. The facility will house four lithium ion battery cell arrays, two with a capacity of two megawatts and two with a capacity of 2.4 megawatts. Together, the battery cell arrays will provide a storage capacity of 8.8 .8 megawatts, which translates to 40.8 megawatt hours of available energy, enough to supply more than 10,000 homes with electricity for one hour. Now there is some installations happening around the world as well. So this is some information about another one on the island of Sicily, which of course is in Europe. San Diego Gas and Electric recently announced it has signed contracts for five new local battery storage facilities, totaling 83.5 megawatts. These four hour energy storage facilities would like be like having batteries for more than 5,500 all electric long range vehicles. So as you can see, a pretty significant amount of capacity there. In addition, the company signed a contract to add 4.5 megawatt demand response program. And they have committed all six contracts to the California Public Utilities Commission for approval. So once again, as we can see there, California is definitely one of the leaders in all of this, but many of the other states are following California's lead on this. Now, this is a project in California, a $448 million behind the meter storage incentive. So this is an incentive program for people to install uh, energy storage systems. So as you can see there, there's some interesting numbers. For projects under 30 kilowatts, 100% of the incentive will be paid up front, which of course isn't often the case. So for wind installation, it's $1.02 per watt. Waste heat to power, $1.02 per watt. Pressure reduction turbine, $1.02 per watt. Internal combustion engine, 42 cents a watt. Micro turbine, gas turbine, and so on. And as we can see there, advanced energy storage, $1.31 per watt. And for a fuel cell, $1.49 per watt. So some pretty interesting incentive programs going on in other places. Of course, we don't have those in Canada, at least not as yet. Tucson Electric signed a solar and storage agreement for less than 4.5 cents a kilowatt hour. They signed the power purchase agreement for a solar plus storage system at an all-in cost significantly less than 4.5 cents per kilowatt hour over 20 years, according to company officials. So that is a tremendous, uh, tremendously cheap power. So the project calls for a 100 megawatt solar array and 30 megawatt storage system, both deployed by an affiliated Next Era Energy. So once again, cost is coming down significantly, and I think that's a very common thread on the material I'm providing here for you today. So by the end of this year, a portion of Stratford, Ontario will be running at least partially on battery power. So a little bit of movement in this industry in Canada. Uh, so this is, of course, in 2017. On June 15th, Festival Hydro announced that it partnered with Hecate Energy, Saturn Power, Alice Dawn Construction, who, of course, is a general contractor and building services to build the largest battery storage facility in Canada, making the first step towards creating microgrid in Stratford. Now, of course, that probably is no longer the largest installation in Canada, but it was as of the day that this was uh, this information was shared in June of 2017. November 2017, Convergent Energy and Power has finished work on an 8.5 megawatt hour energy storage project at Husky Injection Molding System, and that's in Bolton, Ontario, and will be incorporated as, as soon as Hydro One finishes its interconnection work, so getting it tied into the grid. So Convergent worked with Lougheed Martin Energy to install the ladders, Grid Star, once again, lithium ion batteries, they say it also used local vendors for the balance of plant equipment, Ontario-based S&T Electric for construction management, and S&C Lavalin for the design work. And that's information I got from our hosts, EB Magazine. Early this year, Nova Scotia Power launched, launched uh, basically two, pro two pilot projects 
uh, to, to help uh, analyze energy storage and to help it deliver cleaner, affordable, and more reliant energy to Nova Scotians. So known as the intelligent feeder, the pilot involves the installation of residential energy storage batteries, uh, which is Tesla Powerwalls at 10 homes in the Elmsdale community and a much larger grid sized battery at the Elmsdale substation. If you're not familiar with Elm Elmsdale, Elmsdale is, is between the city of Halifax and the Halifax International Airport, which is located north of the city. Now, this is an interesting one. The state of Maryland in the US legislated energy storage tax credits. So they're, they're a leader in that. Uh, you can see some numbers there as far as the size of that energy storage tax credit. Um, so they're probably the first to do that. And of course, that's a really good sign because tax credits, of course, tend to really support business development. So the new era of big batteries has already drawn scrutiny after fiery electric car crashes across America and Europe. So US planners are worried about the risk of hard to control blazes as these power storage units make their way into basements and onto rooftops. One of the challenges here, and we'll see a bit more about this a little later on, is we don't have a lot of installation standards for a lot of these yet. So of course, fire is a huge concern. Uh, when you have a large battery installation, we do have a tremendous amount of energy. And of course, if, we, if things go, go wrong, that energy, of course, lends itself to supporting a fairly significant amount of fire, which of course is a concern for people's safety. So this is another bit of Canadian news. So the investment group puts 99.22 million into Canadian CNI energy storage. CNI, of course, is commercial and industrial. So the commercial and industrial sector energy storage projects in Canada are set to go into high gear. The Swiss investment group SUSI Partners signed a deal for US 94.22 million, which is about 120 million Canadian dollars with a Toronto-based energy storage project develop, developer and owner, NR Store Inc. According to SUSI and NR Store, the new financing will facilitate behind the meter storage for commercial industrial institutional customers. Hydro-Quebec recently announced the opening of a center of excellence in transportation electrification energy storage with the mission of maintaining and enhancing Quebec's global leadership in the field of battery materials. So once again, the improvement in battery technology is an ongoing thing, and uh, it's good to see some of that happening in Canada as well. Now there's some information about a global market forecast. This is from Navigant Research, who does a lot of research in this area. So as we can see there in 2016, not very large, but if you project that forward to 2025, we're looking at just under 35,000 megawatts. And once again, you see the list of the large countries participating in that, United States, France, China, of course, being a very large player, Japan and India. Of course, once again, we don't see Canada on that uh, due to our conservative nature. We'll probably come a little bit later into the game, but we are seeing some inroads and that's a good thing. Now, this is the USA market projection. Once again, as we can see in 2016, that was an estimate of 260 megawatts and by 2020, 1,451 megawatts. So that's only in a space of four years, we're seeing four to five times the growth. Now for residential, the market for residential will be highly concentrated in select markets over the coming years before spreading out to other areas. And of course the Asia Pacific, Western Europe and North America are forecast to account for the vast majority of it. As you can see there, almost 99%. Lithium ion batteries are anticipated to lead this market accounting for about 83% of the installed capacity. Now, once again, there's some uh, market forecast in the residential. As you can see there in 2016, not very much, but by the time you move forward to 2025, between 3,500 and 4,000 megawatts, once again, with the same countries leading the way. Now, in Alberta, and of course, laws and so on are different from province to province, um, the regulatory regime is, is causing major problems for the adoption of energy storage in Alberta. So as a result of that, Rocky Mountain Power has pr provided some information that says those regulations are going to have to change before we see much moving forward in Alberta. 
And once again, of course, those rules do change from one province to the next. And this is more of that. So some industry challenges that we see in battery-based installations. Regulatory issues, some places, not all. There's not a lot of installation standards available yet. A lot of them are in development. I'll go into those a little bit more a little later. We do have some bad press when it comes to battery fires and things like that. And of course, we do not have a lot of available training. However, challenges sometimes do create good opportunities. So with the evolution of the energy storage uh, market, that is causing the utility companies to go through a tremendous amount of change. So the grid is, of course, going through great changes. What we used to see as a one-way grid with centralized generation is now becoming a two-way grid. Uh, the intermittent nature of renewables is causing, of course, problems for the utility companies. Grid stability is always an issue. And, of course, the balancing requirements between production and demand. Now, if you've ever done any research on battery-based energy storage, we have what's known as the duck curve in California. And basically, the duck curve is maximum production of renewable energies does not match peak demand. So what we end up with is large excesses of energy produced when they're not necessarily needed. And of course, that produces what we're talking about all along here today, and that's the need for energy storage. So as we can see here, if you follow the black line on the graph, that basically represents the demand on the grid. Now, if you look at the lower part of the line, when there's very low demand on the grid, if we were to use some extra demand to store those batteries, then when we get to the top of the line, instead of maxing out the demand on the grid, we could supplement the grid with the stored energy from those particular batteries. So we could make that line a lot more flat than if we didn't have energy storage capabilities at all. So going further into utility companies evolution. So what we're seeing of course is a two way grid, central distribution plus distributed resources give us two way flow. Many layers of control and communication are required including SCADA, advanced distribution management systems, advanced metering infrastructure, and that leads us to what's basically now referred to as a smart grid. Over two thirds of the states in the US are undergoing grid modernization. We do have some of that happening here in Canada as well. And of course, storage plus effective control of that stored energy solves a lot of problems, including not having the grid to be able to increase its capacity. Now, this is a list of some of the standards that are either in existence or under development. So AESO section 502.13 battery energy storage facility technical requirements. NFPA, which of course is based in the US, the standard for the installation of stationary energy storage systems. That one is in development with a proposed publishing date of 2020. UL 9540. Uh, a new article in NFP 70, which is, of course, the National Electrical Code, Article 706, that's been updated in the 2017 NEC. NFPA Fire Code, Chapter 52, to deal with venting and so on, where we have off-gassing, where the batteries are being charged. CSAC 22.2, number 107.1, .1, Power Conversion Equipment, UL 1741, deals with inverters. UL 1973 deals with batteries for use in light electric rail. UL 3001 deals with microgrids, that one is in development. The International Fire Code, uh, FM Global Data Sheet 5-33, and the Santa Clara Guideline for Installation of Energy Storage Equipment. That is basically a checklist, but I've had a look at that one and I think it's actually a really good document. Now, one of the other challenges we have when it comes to battery-based installations is there is not a lot of training available, at least not yet. Uh, there is a program started in the U.S., uh, which is a joint venture between the IBEW and the National Electric Contracts Association in the U.S. in response to a boom in the energy storage market. So basically what they have done is they have partnered in putting together a training program for installers, which is basically intended for electricians. 
In the United Kingdom, what store they offer some free training. Now we do have energy storage with a presence in Canada. So we do have an organization called Energy Storage Canada, and you can see the website there if you're interested. They do have a number of events throughout the year. So where do we go from here? Well, keeping up to date with developments and opportunities, uh, there's a number of different uh, um, magazines and so on that deal with what's going on with energy storage. Uh, pursue training if it, as it becomes available. Uh, and making sure that we, if we're contractors, get our fair share of the work. So just to kind of summarize what I've been saying, battery-based energy storage is maturing into a viable grid-scale resource. Battery prices are continuing to fall. Utilities and policymakers are increasingly looking at storage as an alternative to increases in generation. Utility companies will undergo massive changes as storage continues to grow. And of course, there will be opportunities for installers. So on that note, um, I would uh, turn things back over to Anthony for some questions. Earlier on in the presentation, you, you mentioned the Tesla Powerwall and Schneider's offering. Now, can you uh, speak to um, any smartness that these devices might have in terms of, you know, like on their own being able to charge themselves up during off-peak hours, uh, you know, when electricity is cheaper, or uh, is, is is smartness something that the manufacturer is still working on? No, I think most of those actually do have programming capabilities uh, where you can actually program in what time of day you want to be drawing power from the grid. And, uh, and so on. And of course, that would coincide with, with tiered energy rates, which we don't see a lot of here in Canada. But, but like so many other things, I think that day is coming when we will see more and more tiered energy rates. So yeah, I do think most of those do come with, at least the newer ones, come with the ability to program when you're drawing from the grid and so on. I see, I see. Uh, now you also talked about uh, one of the questions that I had is, uh, you know, dealing with the the safety issues, uh, particularly around lithium ion batteries, the, uh, you know, what happens in case of rupture, in case of fire. Uh, now you mentioned the training program that IBW and NECA in the States are, are undertaking for electricians. Do you know if uh, safety is being covered, um, you know, as, as part of that program, part of the certification? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, Anthony, uh, safety is a very big part of that program. Um, I actually had the opportunity to to attend the train the trainer uh, for that uh, that actual program. It was at uh, at the, the in in Ann Arbor, Michigan, at the university there uh, a year ago. And and safety is a very large component of that training. Yes, absolutely. You had uh, you had mentioned the uh, the quote. Uh, from that one supporter, Jan, uh, I, believe, I, I hope I pronounced that correctly, in terms of, uh, you know, what's going on in Alberta uh, with some of the rates and, and how maybe economically it's unfeasible to even consider energy storage. If you had to look uh, across Canada just in a sort of general way instead of jurisdiction specific, are there enough uh, incentives or programs or do we need more, sort of nationwide, if you will, uh, to... To, to get this uh, energy storage jump started, uh, because especially with the push toward renewables, to me, I see them as being hand in hand. But uh, are we doing enough on the you know political and uh, and legislative side to make these things happen? Well, the political stuff, uh, you know, it, it, that does tend to vary greatly from one province to the next. Um, you know, Ontario, of course, being the largest province by far population wise. There are some installations happening in Ontario. Um, uh, I'm aware of about another half a dozen or so that are actually in the process. Uh, I don't have all the details on those, so I, I don't want to guess. Um, you know, I think well, there's certainly room for more incentives. Um, you know, and, and I think part of the problem is, um, you know, we've had lots of incentives for renewables over the years, um, but the missing piece of the puzzle when it comes to renewables is, is storage because, you know, as I mentioned in my presentation, maximum production of renewables doesn't match maximum peak demand on the grid. So the intermediate step is storage. Um, and, and I think reality has to be that we, we do need more incentives. 
Um, what I am very pleased about is to see a smaller province, a relatively smaller province like Nova Scotia, actually, um, you know, uh, having some pilot projects happen there. And, uh, you know, 10 of those are in and actually individual homes. So, um, you know, depending on how those all work out, I, I, I do think, um, once again, being a little conservative by nature, both as consumers and at the political level, I do think we will see more incentives come along. And I, and I certainly hope I'm right on that one. Well, I hope so too. Uh, you know, everybody involved in electrical, uh, you know, could definitely, you know, benefit from, uh, you know, another revenue stream, uh, if you will. Uh, now you had touched upon the training, uh, you know, that's, that's, coming you know for uh, electrical professionals um, but just out of curiosity how does the latest edition of the CE code uh, you know this year's 2018 edition uh, treat energy storage does does it go much in depth um, no it doesn't but what I can tell you um, is that we will see a significant increase in the content of Canadian Electrical Code for 20, for the next one, which will be 2021, there will be a lot more dealing with energy storage, uh, specifically with, with of course, the battery installations. Um, uh, I've been told that, that that there's no doubt that that's going to come in the 2021 edition. Uh, very good, very good. Um, anyway, uh, I think that's about it for questions for now. Uh, but to our audience members, you uh, you see Larry's uh, email up there on screen, uh, lcantlo at shaw.ca. So, you know, feel free to pop him a, a note after the presentation uh, if you have any other questions that you'd rather tackle, you know, sort of one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so again, Larry, thank you so much for being able to share your your expertise um, to our audience. Uh, you know, be sure to visit ebmag.com slash webinars uh, for recordings of uh, this and other past training sessions. Subjects range from arc flash and shock PPE to variable frequency drive cables, business strategy, and, and so on. Uh, so again, Larry, thanks to you out in Alberta, and thanks to all of you for attending. Everyone, please have an excellent day.